Um, so my guest today is Katie Neild, who is a clean air lawyer for Client Earth. Um, those of you who've been following Build Back Better will know that this has been a recurring theme. Uh, and frankly, I don't really think we can do enough of these um, sessions because um, they offer, in my judgment, a really fascinating insight into a kind of litmus test of our times. And that litmus test is, um, do we literally build back better? Um, we, we know that um, the, the global number of excess deaths resulting from dirty air is far exceeds far exceeds by many, many orders of magnitude, the number of people who will die from this pandemic. And that clean air is like this pandemic every year, 10x perpetually. Um, so uh, in just in terms of sheer mortality, but it also um, has enduring sequelae and consequences for health, learning, um, uh, early childhood developments, mental health, um, obesity. Uh, it just has a, a whole series of very, very, very significant consequences. So focusing on it, getting it right, addressing it and improving it so that we emerge from the pandemic with better quality air seems to me to be a really important sort of case study of coming out of this better. And candidly, if we can't come out of it better on clean air, then I think um, it's illustrative of the scale and the nature of the challenges that will occur in other spheres, because this one, at least in my judgment, should be a no-brainer to emerge stronger as a result of this. So um, with that, Katie, let, let's just sort of set the table um, by, by asking you, as you sit here today, um, and if you do a little bit of a kind of projection out over the next six to 12 months, in what ways do you think uh, the fight for clean air will be made easier? Uh, and in what ways do you think it will be made more difficult uh, as we emerge from the pandemic? Um, uh, and let's start with, because we're optimistic here at The Conduit with, um, with how it would be easier. Um, so, I mean, it's always hard to use the word opportunity in this context, because obviously this pandemic has been mainly an absolute disaster. But um, there, are, there, are thing, there are positives that we can definitely take from this. I think, you know, people care about clean air, people care about air quality, and we've known that for a while. But this seems to have really been augmented and people have really become more aware of the quality of the air around them um, during lockdown. And I suppose that's that's because we know that, you know, there are, there are studies coming out showing that that as people have left their cars at home, this has led to decreases in levels of some pollutants. And we know that, you know, polling is showing that people really don't want to go back to a dirty business as usual. Um, sorry, is there background noise? No, not from, yeah. Okay, I, I'm good. Okay, good, good. Sorry, my, um, I think there's some, some noise across the road. Anyway, um, yeah, so, so people have had a taste of cleaner air and I think they really don't want to let go of that. Um, and poll after poll is showing that. Um, and it also means that people are more keen for politicians to take more action to cement that cleaner air going forward. Um, so that's obviously something that we can really harness. Um, but then there are obviously risks too. Um, it would be stupid to deny the fact that there's just going to be less money to spend on, um, on stuff <laughs> from government, but also people uh, in terms of uh, upgrading their vehicles to cleaner vehicles. This might not be something that's so accessible to people going forward, uh, but also businesses too, as they kind of struggle to recover um, during an economic recession. Um, but again, there's a, there's a real opportunity for, for government to use this as a chance to turn things around. Um, and there are lots of things that they could be doing. And there's been a lot of talk about a kind of 
clean and green and healthy recovery. But um, what we don't really know at the moment is, is what the government thinks that means. So, so let's deal with some of the challenges. There are two that, that you know, I keep hearing. One is that as, as people are anxious about taking public transport and as they resort back to private vehicles, we will actually uh, get um, road congestion and vehicle use um, spiking up to higher levels than before the pandemic, at least in the short term, and people will use cars that, as you just said, are not going to be EVs and are likely to be polluting. Um, and secondly, it delays on the ultra low emission zones that we have previously thought were really important um, regulatory protectors of clean air. We've seen those either be delayed or cancelled in certain cities. Um, so those two strike me as kind of worrying setbacks. Are, are, is that your kind of view as well? Uh, yeah, definitely. And um, thanks for filling in those gaps in my answers because they, those are really key. Um, and we already know that not only is there a risk that, you know, these short term improvements we've seen are probably going to be short lived unless action is taken. So kind of cement them and lock them in. But we only need to look at other countries like China. And we've seen reports showing a really rapid rebound in car use and a really rapid rebound in um, pollution levels um, resulting from that. And some places like Shenzhen um, in, Ch in mainland China have reported um, higher concentration levels for certain pollutants now than they were doing prior to the pandemic. And, and for me, that's really terrifying, um, especially when, you know, not only um, was the health of protecting people's health important before, but we've got people who are recovering from a disease that essentially affects their respiratory health. And we're, we're seeing studies come out that actually um, long-term exposure to air pollution um, increases people's vulnerability to this disease too. So, you know, the argument for action is even stronger than it already was. Like you, you, you mentioned, you know, that the, the stats are already massive <laughs> with respect to the need to tackle this, this problem. Um, but I feel like that is, is augmented now to a greater degree. Um, and we've also seen a, a couple of weeks ago, there was a report released that showed that we're seeing the same thing happen in Europe as we've seen happen in China already. Um, so after these kind of lockdown lows in pollution levels, we're already seeing an uptick um, happening as people get back in their cars. And unfortunately um, in the UK, we've, we've heard the prime minister kind of actively urge people to get back in their cars and avoid um, public transport. And like you say, this, this comes with a huge risk of things actually getting worse um, and roads clubbing, clogging up to a greater degree. Um, and you mentioned the ultra low emission zone in London uh, was kind of uh, was lifted for a little while. That's back in place now, which is really good and really important and really necessary. Um, but we're not seeing that happening across the country. Um, we're seeing commitments to clean air zones, which basically operate in the same way as the low emission zone. We're seeing commitments to those clean air zones that are essentially there to protect people's health being delayed and local authorities, local leaders, but also central government are, are dragging their feet with respect to putting these really urgent and important measures in place. Um, so we really, really need greater, greater leadership from that. And I think kind of, I don't know, just, just finally to, to link that back into one of the risks, I think, you know, this was always the case, but we need clean air zones to get the most polluting vehicles out of our most polluted areas. But people need help and support to make those cleaner transport choices. Um, it just cannot be fair to start penalising people for driving vehicles that they were originally incentivised to buy, you know, five, ten years ago, um, without providing them with clean alternatives. And, and again, the case for that is stronger now. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, for me, one of the great challenges of the climate movement is to make sure that it, you know, that it promotes a transition, for sure, but also in this kind of, you know, I think very important terminology, a just transition, a transition that takes into account 
the needs of people who have been left behind, who have experienced inequality um, and who are very much at risk and are even more so at risk economically as a result of the pandemic. Um, and so simply slapping regulation upon people but not helping them make the necessary adjustments in order to comply with those regulations, I think is A, a, a recipe for resentment and backlash and B, is just morally unjust. So I think you know, we have to do both. So, so let's talk about um, the new climate bill that's going through the UK and that I know you're, you're looking at. Tell us what's good about it uh, and tell us what needs to be improved and then you know, what we as citizens can do to ensure that this um, important regulatory moment um, can be, can be optimised. Um, so, so we have a new environment bill. It was introduced at the beginning of this year, but it's been kind of put on hold because of, because of COVID. But it's still on its way through Parliament. And it's really important for clean air because through this bill, the government does what sounds like a very positive thing and could be a very positive thing um, in committing to setting long-term legally binding targets for air quality. So set a kind of long-term ambition for cleaning up the air that we breathe. And that is obviously so important and sounds wonderful. Unfortunately, the reason we're not quite jumping up and down for joy yet is that the kind of devil is really in the detail in this bill. And so we're really working hard to make sure that it's amended and strengthened. And the main weaknesses are that there is this headline requirement to have a new legally binding target for air quality, but there's nothing in there to suggest what it will be and whether and how it will actually act to better protect people's health which is obviously what this should all be about um, and the reason why this is really important is that one of the most harmful pollutants um, in this country that we suffer from is called particulate matter and we have an existing legal limit but it's two times higher than the world health organization guideline so we have legal levels of this pollutant at the moment, um, but they're no way safe. Uh, so we need the law to be tightened to drive national level action to drive down this pollutant and protect people's health. And at the moment that's lacking, the Environment Bill provides a door for that gap to be filled, but we don't have um, much kind of certainty or clarity under the terms of the bill that that's actually what's going to be achieved. So we want government to commit to World Health Organization guidelines by 2030. Um, and we're really pushing really hard for that. And, and there's a whole host of support for this uh, from across health and environmental charities like the British Lung Foundation, the British Heart Foundation, Friends of the Earth, the Greenpeace, are all behind this. Um, and so this is a key moment uh, for pressure on government to commit. So this kind of stirs the inner activist in me. So I'm kind of interested in, in where we're at on this, right? So to be clear, mm -hmm. have a bill going through Parliament. Mm -hmm. It will set a new air quality level. That new level has yet to be determined. And we're in a moment right now where there's everything to fight for. The existing level is more than two times higher than the World Health Organization recommendation for what we should be enduring mm -hmm. this in a context of the worst worst pandemic in living memory which has assaulted our lungs mm -hmm. um, so it would seem from an activist point of view this should be the best moment in history to win the getting the level to where it needs to be consistent with human health my feeling I mean, there's a lot of kind of um, materials on clean air more than in the last sort of four months than there has been before. If you read The Guardian and The Financial Times and The New York Times and, you know, The Economist and whatever. But I'm not entirely sure that there is a kind of popular campaign or movement or citizen agitation around it which corresponds with the assault on our health and the level of urgency we should be feeling. Do you think I'm right? Uh, I think everything you said just now is right, obviously. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, you're correct to say that, you know, we've been calling for this for ages. 
but the position we're in right now makes the arguments even even stronger than it was before and i think there is a real opportunity and this environment bill provides that opportunity for for people to get pissed off <laughs> about what the law says at the moment and the fact that it quite frankly isn't good enough to protect people's health and i mean not only does the bill itself not commit to world health organization guidelines but it doesn't really mention human health very much at all um, it's an environment bill and it covers a whole, a whole host of other stuff like waste, biodiversity, which are all incredibly important and have their own challenges. But it seems bizarre to shoehorn air quality into a piece of legislation without saying really frankly on the face of it that this is, this is there to protect people's health. Um, and, you know, we've been, um, we've been pushing for amendments to this bill and some of them have already been discussed by the, the minister. Um, who kind of come back and say oh, it's just really hard and complicated <laughs> um okay so let me understand this because so on the one hand you have all citizens regardless of class ethnicity socioeconomic status and in fact we know that clean air and dirty air is likely to be concentrated and target poor people, um, people from marginalized communities more. Um, but, you know, it's also something which affects, you know, people in Knightsbridge and Kensington as well. So you, you do have an opportunity to kind of have a cross-class alliance on this as well. Um, and so who's on the other side of this and where are they deriving their political power from? And if you just set the world health, you know, the, the air quality level to the World Health Organization guidelines, what would have to change and who would lose? And why is it that you can't just go to the Minister for the Environment and, and say to them, this should be a no brainer. It should be <laughs> good for health, good for citizens, good electorally, you know, so there's something I'm missing as to where the pushback is. I know it's there, but articulate it for us. Yeah, that's a good question. Why not? <laughs> um, and like the reason that government is saying why not is that unlike the pollutants that, that principally come from road transport, which is which is where a lot of our action is, is, is being focused so far, because that's where we still have illegal levels of air pollution, this particulate matter pollution is from a more wide range of sources. So we're talking agriculture, we're talking domestic burning, industry, but also transboundary um, pollution from, from things coming from across Europe. Um, so it is a more complicated picture, but we know that it's not, it is achievable. World Health Organization guidelines are achievable. And, and the frustrating thing is that government actually has commissioned research into this um, that was released last year to show that it is feasible to reach World Health Organization guidelines across the UK. It, it might not be the easiest thing <laughs> or the cheapest thing to do, but when you think about the social um, and health costs associated, or the, the social and health benefits associated with, with reducing this really harmful pollutant, I, I agree that it's a no-brainer. Um, and uh, I think government is uh, reticent to commit to something that is concrete within law um, that it isn't completely absolutely sure that it can achieve and my concern is that when you're talking about long-term targets that are 10 years down the line you need uh, you need pure ambition <laughs> alongside absolute um, and not just absolute certainty because otherwise how would you ever set long-term targets for anything um, so I mean, I, I, it would require action from across the board, but that's not a reason not to do it. I mean, it seems to me that this is a case study of building a movement which draws inspiration from the kind of energy, anger and outrage that the Black Lives Matter movement has, has been managed to mobilize, you know, more recently, or as we've said in other um, webinars, you know, take a, a leaf out of the book of the LGBTQ community where you've taken issues that seemed at one point marginal and peripheral and interest mm. of interest only to a small number of people and put it into the, the heart of the public square. And this has the great advantage of being of interest to literally 
everyone. Everybody. <laughs> so um, uh, there's some interesting um, litigation going on right now. You had mentioned um, so trying to cast um, this is a human rights issue and taking an Article Two argument about the right to life and 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 say that you know clean air you have a positive obligation as a state to protect people's right to life and mm -hmm. clean air. Um, uh, dirty air is, is risks your, your right to life. And I will say parenthetically, this Article 2 argument has been made in other spheres. So in the human rights space, in relation to international crimes, Article 2 arguments have been used to um, force states to prosecute and punish people responsible for gross violations of human rights to say, if you don't prosecute people responsible for genocide, war crimes, and torture, you're not protecting your citizens' right to life. Um, and I think it's not a very big conceptual or jurisprudential leap to say, if you are not ensuring adequate air quality standards, you are jeopardizing citizens' right to life. So tell us where this legislation is at and whether you think it may help in setting the right levels of, uh, of air quality in a regulatory environment? Um, yeah, it's a really good point. And obviously human rights, human rights is, 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 is really relevant to the environment, but then also to, to air quality. And we are seeing this starting to play out in the courts. So there is an ongoing inquest into the really tragic death of a, of a young girl called Ella Kissy Deborah, who died in 2013 from, from a fatal asthma attack. Um, and she lived just by the South Circular. She went to school there too. Um, and since her death, um, some new evidence has come to light, which kind of quite strongly correlates her trips to hospital and her really severe asthma attacks with peaks and spikes in pollution levels. And as a, as a result of that evidence, they've opened up a new inquest into her death based on Article 2 and the state's obligation to, to, to protect people's life. Um, and it's going to call into question um, whether the state was doing what it should have been doing to protect Ella from the harmful impacts of air pollution. Um, and so, you know, obviously this is a hugely important case that could mean a lot to how um, air pollution and its impact on people are dealt with by the courts. And I think um, this is a problem that is shared with many other kind of environmental issues too, such as climate change. But there's, and without getting too techy about it, it's hard when you have a population level problem that we have very clear evidence that it's affecting the population in a certain way. You know, you've referred to kind of premature death statistics before. Um, but linking somebody's actions to somebody's harm in a kind of cause effect to an individual can still be quite tricky because this evidence is on, on epidemiological scale, so kind of population level, and drilling that down to the individual, which is kind of essentially what the, the law tends to require you to do in these kind of human rights or, or tort-based actions. Um, and it's that, that hurdle that is still yet to be overcome, but I don't think it's unattainable in the future. You know, the evidence is getting stronger and stronger um, uh, with respect to the impacts on human health of air pollution. Um, and, and I think that we could, we could get there. Jody asked a question uh, around um, the link between the built environment and air quality, um, you know, energy efficient homes, passive homes, wood burning, home fireplaces, burning garden waste, bonfires. Can you tell us a little bit about those as, as sources of air pollution and what we may be able to, to do about that? Um, yeah, uh, she raises a really important point because, I mean, the fact is that a lot of this really harmful pollution is coming from dispersed sources. So sources from individuals' behaviour. Obviously, state regulation and stuff has an impact on that, but, you know, it's people driving, um, people burning um, solid fuels within their homes. And so the way that our built environment is constructed, both, both with respect to how things are built um, uh, to be close to where you live and work, um, but also with respect to, like you say, energy efficiency, et cetera, it's really, really key. Um, and I think, you know, the, the PM's speech, was it yesterday, was talking about build, build, build. Um, and my concern is that if you build, build, build without kind of locking in 
a requirement for this, these kind of energy efficiency measures, but also, you know, promoting developments that allow people to walk and cycle places rather than rely or continue to rely on car transport. You are kind of locking in for quite a long time these harmful and polluting behaviours. So I think, I think you're right. I think at the moment the planning system doesn't work in a way that makes much sense with respect to air pollution. You can, you can still build a development uh, in an area with really harmful levels of pollution that, that adds to the problem. Um, I, I question whether that should be something that is, is, should happen going forward. Um, and there are definitely ways that we can improve on that legislation. Um, and I know that some, uh, some industry bodies are, are looking at you know, putting forward a healthy homes bill um, to try and incorporate, um, incorporate the uh, air quality requirements in, into those kind of developments. Um, we spoke before we went live about mayoral elections and how mayors have particular power in this regard in relation to ultra low emission zones, but other things that they can do at a more sort of um, a local level. Um, is this coming up in mayoral elections? What can we do as citizens, um, you know, other than vote for people who have sensible policies? But tell us how this is likely to play out in London and other places at, at a mayoral level. So, yeah, this is a really key moment in lots of areas across the country for clean air. So London, for example, we've got the ultra low emission zone, which we know uh, led to a, a decrease of a third um, in, in nitrogen dioxide pollution in the capital after six months after it was put in place. So we know that these kind of clean air zones, these low emission zones are really effective at driving down harmful pollution. So it's absolutely imperative that they remain where they are, which is basically only London. But there's also plans in 2021 to expand the ultra low emission zone to the North and South Circular. And we know that certain mayoral candidates like Sean Bailey um, have spoken out against that and have spoken out against the ultra low emission zone. Um, so it's really, really key that we keep pressure on candidates to retain those, those commitments and, and use your vote accordingly. Um, I think what's really frustrating that we see in London, but also elsewhere is the reliance on kind of arguments relating to social justice as a reason not to take action on clean air, which for me is very counterintuitive. Like we spoke about air quality actually being a social justice issue. Um, the poorest are hit the hardest, but contribute the least to the problem. Um, so saying that measures like the ultra low emission zone are actually um, bad for poorer communities um, doesn't make a huge amount of sense. Um, what should instead be happening is, is providing more help and support for those people to shift to cleaner forms of transport. Um, but there are also mayoral elections happening elsewhere in the country in places like you know, Greater Manchester. Um, and Greater Manchester um, is, uh, in response to, to um, the pandemic has said that it's going to delay its clean air zone plans until 2022. Um, and they've claimed that that's because it's hard at the moment to carry out their public consultation, um, which seems like a very strange excuse to me. <laughs> so I feel that, uh, yeah, that the election there next year is also a really key moment to push for a clean air zone in Greater Manchester because it's got one of the worst um, pollution levels in the country and, and that just simply can't continue. I can't help feeling that um, this is an area where um, it's a little bit on us as it were, you know, I mean certainly not on you because you get up every day and do this work, it's on all the rest of us, but it's, um, it is on us not to be winning this argument. It's, you know, there's some fights that are hard to win. This should be the biggest no-brainer fight to win. It affects everybody. It adversely affects children. It more affects people who are poor. It affects communities of color. It has massive mortality level uh, uh, consequences. It is like, uh, poor air is like having double classroom sizes in terms of impeding learning. It has all these consequences. And we have a bill in the UK right now, which will set a level and there is everything to fight for. And it's almost like, you know, that's what activists dream for. You get to a regulatory moment and then you have to set it. 
Um, and I think your point around um, the general epidemiological level phenomenon and data and then reducing it down to individual people, it feels as though what we have not done well enough is um, frame the questions in ways that are accessible to ordinary people. So to be able to find um, you know, in some ways that we've seen with, with George Floyd, right? So martyrs, people whose um, deaths embody a, an ongoing systemic injustice, but a movement crystallizes around something really, really, you know, just particularly egregious. Um, and, and I think distilling these down into simple narratives and then hammering on those narratives and winning those narratives seems like really an important moment right now. Um, is there a coalition of organizations working on this that um, are coordinating a big public relations sort of activism moment? Um, who are they? What can people do to help? How can they support? Um, what more can we be doing? Um, yes, yeah, so I mean there are coalitions and, and also on, on, on both kind of levels. So we've got and we are part of um, the Healthy Air campaign, which is a coalition of both environmental NGOs but also health NGOs and, and also kind of trade union organisations too. So we've got the British Lung Foundation, the British Heart Foundation, um, UNICEF, Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, uh, um, the Tra Trade Union Council on Air Quality. Um, so, you know, it's a really broad coalition, which is great and, and speaks to the, the issues you're talking about. This is a societal problem, so it, so it should be a broad coalition. But we are, we are working really hard to influence this, this bill at key stages. Um, and then on the other level, um, we also help coordinate um, a, a clean air parents network. So for parents, because obviously, as you said, this, this is an issue that really especially Im impacts children. It leads to stunted lung development, uh, but also lower birth weights and can affect the children's learning. So there are a lot of parents out there that are really worried um, about air pollution as an issue um, and worried that obviously there is, as an individual, not a huge amount that you can do to impact upon your day-to-day -day exposure. Um, so joining something like the Clean Air Parents Network is a great way to get, to get involved on the ground. Um, and also get involved with some of the kind of decision making that we were talking about um, locally. So these mayoral elections coming up, but also local authorities, air quality plans um, that are coming out at the moment to, to, to put forward these clean air zone measures to, to achieve legal levels of air pollution. So there are those kind of two, two levels on which you can really get stuck in and get involved. But as you say, the Environment Bill at the moment is our, is our real focus with respect to activism and advocacy. Um, with the mayoral elections coming along next year um, to follow on. To that end, Jody just recommended uh, on the chat a book to everybody, a book called The Invisible Killer, The Rising Global Threat of Air Pollution and How We Can Fight Back by Gary Fuller. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, I think, something that people may want to look at. Um, and I think what we will do after this is um, get our programming team just to do a download with you and post a set of resources of how people can get involved and support. I mean, I will do a shameless plug for Client Earth because I'm just a giant fan of everything that you guys do. Um, and I think having both lawyers and activists work on these in smart ways is an essential part of any movement. So supporting client earth is obviously a, uh, an important way of, of doing this as well. Katie, we are out of time, but um, I wanted to thank you for your work. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm troubled that this, the, that this campaign in this moment is in fact at risk at a moment when it should really be, um, we should really be winning. But I, but I think it, there is no question that there is everything to fight for. And I think, if you just kind of zoom back for a moment, um, moments like this where we either build back better or build back worse, the difference lies in human engagement and citizen engagement and, and activism. Um, and it's really up to us to win or lose on something which just has such clear impacts on everybody, but particularly the people we care about who are the most vulnerable and the most marginalized and the most exposed. So thank you for your work. We will continue to shout from the treetops on your behalf. Um, Great. And, and, and uh, 
we look forward to kind of looking at the resources you'll post for us. All right, thanks very much. Okay, everybody, stay safe and stay well, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.